asked me in private, and I hand over the, the mic to the next speaker. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next talk is uh, from Yuri. So. Hello. One, one, one. Okay. Very good. Um, I just wanted to present a little talk about what's happening with Google, with open source at Google, and I will start by presenting a number of projects which were initiated by Google, eventually open sourced and got into Debian, and then I'll present some other information about go open source related resources provided by Google. So this is kind of random selection, and those are mostly the projects which I heard about, and uh, they were announced within Google and then open sourced. So for example, Gennady is a tool for management of Zen clusters. You can find the inform more information at gennadygooglecode.com. If you have a lot of Zen clusters to manage, it can help with automatically starting up, shutting down, failing over, and managing the disks of these instances. There is this OS installation support. There it doesn't offer live instance migration at the time. It is already in Debian. You can just apt get install Gennady. Another project is Zuma Store. This is the storage system, which basically provides snapshotting, and reportedly this snapshotting file system snapshotting and replication. Reportedly, it is better than LVM because if you create multiple snapshots with LVM, then a changed block in your original file system will correspond to a changed block in each of the LVM snapshots. And this system allows you to create multiple snapshots and you will still have one <laughs> block per each changed block in your original file system. So it scales a little bit better. It provides the replication capabilities, so you can create, periodically create snapshots of your file system, and then only changed blocks will be sent to, to a remote location. It is GPL version 2, not yet in Debian, but pre-built Debian packages are available from zoomastore.org. Uh, finally, one of the last large open sourcings at Google is Protobuf protobuf.google.com, Fem fancy description is it's flexible, efficient mechanism for serializing structured data. Basically what it means is that you can easily obtain binary representation of complicated data structures. So there is a protobuf meta language which you run a proto compiler on and it generates C++ code for setting the values, getting the binary output, decoding, and so on. So if you're working on any kind of distributed system, it's, you are most probably will be interested in it because it's very good to do message parsing, RPC calls, you can even store the data in this form with very low overhead. The, all these libraries and Java and Python bin bindings are available in Debian already, and it's Apache license 2.0. So code.google.com is a general open source project hosting service which provides uh, some web space for documentation and files. It provides SVN, SVN repository browser. I believe you can also browse the SVN repositories which are not hosted on this service. Uh, it provides wiki and the issue tracking tool for each project. So if you're looking for hosting for your next project, this is one more thing to consider. Finally, uh, while this is not directly related to open source, it's still very cool. <laughs> This is one of the services which Google advertised recently. It's called Google App Engine, and it basically allows you to run your application on Google infrastructure. Um, Guido Van Rossum was one of the persons behind it, major driving force. Uh, it provides a Python API to Google-specific data store authentication, URL access, and email access, so that once you write your application using this API, you can run it on Google infrastructure. Most Python frameworks support it, and Django in particular is included in the SDK. The, it provides you with a fully integrated application environment. It is free to get started at this point, and you get a fair amount of resources, something like 500 megabyte of storage space and something like 5 million page views per month. However, there is a catch that at this point you're only allowed to create three 
projects for, for each person. Uh, this page, code at google.com slash appengine, has some nice videos, both a tutorial on how to use it and a talk by Guido on appengine security, I believe. And finally, I just, when I was preparing this, I remembered that project called readville.google.com is an open source code review application by Guido, which runs on appengine and which different open source applications can use. Thank you. Thank you. And the next talk is from Jakob. Okay. Here you are. They, they are turning on. No. Uh, hi. Uh, microphone, maybe? Is it ready? Can you hear me? Does it work? Hi. Okay, so um, I uh, started a research project about a year ago where I realized it was possible to um, freeze the memory of a computer in order to extract. Uh, the contents of it. Um, so we wrote a, a paper about this that we submitted to Usenix Security, and uh, just last week we found out it won the best paper, which is pretty cool. Um, basically, there are a couple of different methods for doing these types of attacks, and um, all of them require physical access in most people's minds, though actually that's not the case. Uh, it's possible to execute a couple of them over the network. And so in order to show this, we released the source code for this, which I'm going to probably package for Debian either in the next couple of days or next week or something. But um, the basic idea is that um, memory retains state even after power off, which means that if you quickly reboot a machine or if you cool a machine and power the memory on later, you can extract the memory from it. And uh, to a lot of hardware engineers, this was sort of obvious. Um, to a lot of software people, this was pretty devastating because uh, a machine that um, has cryptographic keys like um, I don't know, does anybody here encrypt their hard drive with uh, Debian's DMcrypt, maybe? Anybody? All right, so we broke DMcrypt um, on Debian, specifically. Um, and the way that we did that was by um, basically taking a, a, a ThinkPad. Anybody here using a ThinkPad in DMcrypt? All right, cool. So uh, what we did was we um, took the ThinkPad and uh, we turned it off, turned it back on, booted a small program. Uh, we have a couple of payloads. One of them is a Pixie boot payload. Uh, basically, we serve it out with a DHCP server, and it spits out the memory of the computer over the network. Uh, we have another program. It's a key finder. It extracted the AES key. Uh, and then basically using that, we were able to uh, mount the file system of the computer. Um, so it's like um, not very difficult. The, we also have the, the ability to reconstruct keys. So the basic idea is that uh, there might be some decay in memory because bits, uh, bits will decay in a predictable way. And uh, our reconstruction algorithm uh, works like with up to 10 or 15 percent of bit error rates. And uh, we actually never saw anything more than, I think, point, uh, 0 0.1 percent bit decay. So our algorithms are pretty overkill for that. But um, it might be interesting to come up with a way. I talked with Theodore Rate of uh, OpenBSD about this. But it might be interesting to come up with some things that you can do to detect when someone might be cooling your system or to have a panic, uh, a panic button. And Theo and I came up with the idea of a patch to mAdvise. Basically, you could say, there's a whole bunch of software on this computer. And uh, it would be really useful if, in the event of some sort of security panic, that you killed these bits first. And we don't care about having a kernel panic. We don't care about a piece of software crashing. Those bits have to die no matter what in the event of a panic. And you might just have a couple of milliseconds if you can detect an event. This might be like a case intrusion detection sensor. It could be a temperature sensor. Um, new DDR3 chips have um, specific temperature sensors on the memory. And you can set interrupts. You can say, if it, I guess, if it drops below a certain temperature, then that's a specific thing you want to catch. And then you want to do a specific action. So it would be kind of interesting to talk with some Debian people about making it possible for uh, creating this uh, sort of like catch and uh, erase situation. Because as it stands right now, it's pretty difficult to, uh, even if you were to detect an event, to actually ensure that you killed all of the bits properly. Like just uh, trying to remove dmcrypt should, in theory, get rid of the keys in memory because dmcrypt does the right thing. But if you can never hit that entry point and you can never actually destroy those keys, then you won't really be able to erase them. And those keys will continue to be there. We have an iPod-based payload, too. So if you have an iPod, we can put this memory dumper on it, and it'll dump it into the iPod. And we also have um, uh, EFI. So if anyone here is running Mac OS X on Apple hardware or has uh, Debian running on Apple hardware, it could also probably dump the memory. But we haven't tried that for that. 
Um, anyway, if anybody has any questions, you can talk to me about it afterwards. So. Thanks. The next one is Frank about uh, source-centric views. No? Do you hear me? Okay. So, um, one problem that we have um, is we have um, <coughs> so many packages in our archive, um, and this ma makes it difficult for our users of, or for ourselves to find software and to find the right combinations of software to install. So, obviously, um, uh, one solution that was proposed for this is, uh, for example, Deptex, which makes it easier to search for software by their, uh, by, by their um, yeah, features uh, and uh, de uh, implement uh, implementation details and stuff like that. Um, and I think uh, one thing we should consider is uh, to um, also group software better. Um, for example, if you um, install a binary package, you have, um, you have a certain set um, of suggest and recommends um, which uh, should tell you which uh, packages go together with this, uh, with this uh, software. But um, I, I have the feeling that this is often redundant information and what you really want is uh, a view where you see, okay, this package com from comes from this source, um, and this source has the following binary packages, um, and um, there's one binary package that is like uh, the main package of this source, which we often have, and then uh, there are the translation packages, and um, there are, are the data packages, and stuff like that, so um, what I, uh, what uh, my idea was um, is that we should yeah, give the user more information about which packages belong together in a group without um, having uh, necessarily to specify all uh, the right suggests and recommends, um, but just uh, give them um, yeah, a little bit higher view over the archive. Because we, we ta um, with the time, uh, with time, we tend to split up packages um, uh, in uh, increasing speed by, uh, so that we can, um, uh, for example, we uh, have an increasing number of packages that put their um, arch independent <coughs> data to a data package so that uh, the mirror space isn't, isn't wasted for it. Um, and um, we have packages that uh, move their translations uh, out to um, singular packages, and we have uh, packages that try to uh, find uh, find the packaging so that um, all the bits um, that don't need any uh, GUI interface uh, like X or uh, GTK, GNOME um, belong to one package, and uh, all the uh, stuff that uh, um, does need it uh, gets its extra packages so that the dependencies are more granular, more, more finer. Um, and what I have the feeling is that uh, in this process, um, we get lost in, in these uh, huge number of packages, which normally don't interest in anyone unless they get installed by requirements uh, or by dependencies. So um, I think uh, we could profit from uh, yeah, exposing the user more which packages came from the same source and from the um, and what option he has to combine these packages uh, together. Um, so one thing I want would like to add uh, w is descriptions for source packages. Currently, um, we only have description for binary package, but it would probably be useful to have description for source packages. Um, and maybe the possibility to um, specif specify um, yeah, in more detail 
what, uh, what the task of a package um, inside its source group is, so that a source could specify which of its binary packages is the most important, the one that the user should present it first with, um, and which ones are just uh, dependency packages um, or stuff like that. So that's something, um, that's just an idea that I had during DevConf and that I want to work uh, after DevConf on uh, to see whether it's feasible and whether it brings actually good results. And if someone is interested in, just talk with me. Thanks. Thanks, Fra Thanks Frank. The next one is Eshe about Terminator making the GUI terminal fun again. Uh, hi, is this on? Can you all hear me? Am I? Great. Okay, so um, I didn't write Terminator. It's written by someone else, but I've been using it a lot lately, and I thought I kept getting questions about it, so I thought I would give a lightning talk about it and why I like it. Um, let me say a little bit about myself first. I've tried using tiling window managers before, and they were never really fun, at least beyond the first couple days. It's I felt that structuring my windows into non-overlapping segments lost me a lot of freedom that I wanted. And also, uh, maybe it's as heretical to say, but I actually like Network Manager. <laughs> uh, I, there's probably some of you who aren't laughing who are probably hopefully thinking, yeah, it works for me also, so I kind of like it too. I hope that there's you know, well, at least one other person like that in the room. And um, so the, you know, having the GNOME panel there actually would be a nice thing. And most of the tiling window managers I've seen, there's one of them that says, um, you know, and the fact, hey, my GNOME program doesn't work with this window manager. And he says, GNOME is terrible, don't use it. But I have applications that I want to use. I don't use my computer solely to run his window manager. So, um, but I do like terminals, obviously, and I like thinking about solving problems in terms of stacks, like call stacks. So, um, with that, I guess I'm going to quickly run a demo of how I like to use Terminator. So, first of all, Control Shift P and Control Shift N is how I'm switching back and forth. Um, I might run a mail client and find an email, and it tells me that I have to do something. It tells me I have to set some configuration options for these Git repositories. So, let's split the window horizontally, and. Last ten years, I think. So I'm going to just clone the Git configuration for the where these repositories are. So I like this um, because I still have this window visible. <coughs> if I were using GNOME Terminal or Xterm or something simpler, I would have opened a new window, and it may or may not have overlapped with the one I actually wanted to see. Um, so if I look in here, I can edit gitosis.conf. I know I need to add some configuration to this, but I can't remember what the configuration line is supposed to look like. So I'll actually, in a new terminal, find another example. And I'll look at my personal git configuration. So the, the nice thing about this is that as I open a new terminal, uh, the old contents are still visible and are still modifiable. Um, as I wait for my own configuration to download, I guess I also like the fact that when I open a new terminal, it creates pressure for me to close it eventually. Otherwise, I end up with 50 terminals on one screen, and I never remember why I created them. So in this one, uh, oh, it's called description. OK, great. And it's in a repo block. So then now I just know that uh, he needs repo lib validator dot git description <coughs> is this. Uh, so what I like about this, just to be clear, is that I got to create new terminals and this is the whole call stack for actually executing 
the action that I was emailed to do. Uh, the first window uh, told me I needed to create, open up the CC, open up one Gitosis configuration. And when I got there, I learned I needed to open up another one. And I can just use the keyboard to hop between them, close this, now that I know how to do it, exit, save this, git add it, git commit it, and then when I push it, it'll actually be live on the website. And then I'll exit. Um, the window collapses, and I could reply and say I've done it. So that's how I like to use Terminator as sort of function call stacks for executing actions. Thanks. OK, thanks, Ashley. The next one is Paul about um, Zynfig. Oh, yeah, already. It's on. Okay. Um, do you want to yeah. Uh, this is Synfig Animation Studio. Um, it's a set of tools that that put in the hands of artists to produce realistic compositions and at the same time complex animation. It combines high dynamic color range and spatial and temporal independence with an interface built for, especially for artists. It produces 2D animations um, and utilizes tweening to reduce the effort needed to put into an animation. It was written by Vor Voria Studios and was turned over to the free software community after the, the company went out of business. It's written in C++ and released under the GPL. There is a vibrant user community. Every month we have uh, artist challenges, and the latest one involves um, kinematic type typography. Um, we use ISC and web forums to communicate. Some of the tools that it provides uh, geometric shapes, blurs, distortions, filters, fractals, gradients, text, um, simple particle systems, stylization, and other effects. We need developers, so if anyone knows C++ and wants to get involved, please see me afterwards. And I'll leave the rest of the lightning talk to the shiny things on the screen. Wrong is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so it's four and a half minutes long, so we enjoy the last minute.
Thanks, thanks, Paul. So the next one is uh, Jacob. Jacob about Tor. Hi again. That's a really tough. That's a really tough act to follow, man. So um, I spent some time uh, while at DevConf learning about uh, Google Maps API, which is not really that interesting, but it made it really easy to display some data that I was interested in. If you could zoom in on South America, that would be cool. So um, just like since I have only a short amount of time here, I wanted to get a sense of who's familiar with Tor. Um, is everybody here? Great. All right, so I don't need to tell you about what Tor is. That's uh, excellent. Um, for those following along at home, please read our website at torproject.org. Um, but basically, um, I wanted to do some data visualization to sort of understand the clicks that exist within the Tor network. And um, should you drag the map a little bit so we can see New Zealand also, like just a little bit, a little out? So one thing you'll notice is that we have very few nodes outside of North America and Europe. I mean, this is incredible. We have, uh, this, this plot's about 1,000 nodes. This is for the um, V3 consensus protocol. So it doesn't include all of the Tor nodes around the world. But um, South America is very poorly represented. We have about, say, seven nodes in total in South America. And if you zoom in on any other part of the map at all, like if you could zoom in on Europe, if you could zoom in on Europe, that would be fabulous. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, the CCC has done uh, kind of an incredible job here with getting Tor adopted by people, in that if pretty much every town in Germany has one Tor node. <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. Like, could you zoom in here a little more? Just, just uh, click on the map. Double click there a couple times. Should zoom in. Well, all right, it's too dense for you to do it, so you'll have to use the, but there's basically like uh, hundreds and hundreds of nodes per small section of Germany. Um, so one thing I was looking for is for people that are running nodes that are not in Europe or North America or who have servers that are not in North America or in Europe and they would be interested in running a Tor node. And I'd like to uh, talk with you about how you could share some of your network bandwidth uh, in order to help people that maybe need to use Tor. Uh, this includes like journalists. It includes people who want to do research on topics where they require personal privacy. Like maybe they want to read Wikipedia articles without letting people know who uh, they're interested in reading about or topics that are sensitive in their pr particular area. Um, and uh, doing this data visualization made me realize that we have a bunch of users from these places, um, um, obviously in Germany, but we also have a lot of users in China. We have users in South America. We have users in Africa. According to the maps that I did, which might be incorrect, we have basically not very many nodes in Africa at all. It looked like one. Um, so if anyone here would be interested, I would love to, I can help you set it up. We have Debian packages. And uh, I'd love to talk about like the risks and rewards of doing this, and I think it would be pretty fabulous. So, anyway, thanks. Thank you. The next one is uh, Aurien about uh, the K3ABSD project in Debian. Could you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'll just give you a, a, a brief, uh, brief introduction of GNU K3BSD. So GNU K3BSD is basically a FreeBSD kernel with a GNU libc. Currently, we are using either K, uh, K3BSD, the kernel of FreeBSD version 7.0 uh, in our unstable ports, and version 7.1 in experimental. It uses a GNU user land, and it comes so with cool Debian tools like dpackage, apt, and it consists actually in two Debian ports, the AMD64 one and the IS386 one. So why would you want to choose uh, Debian with FreeBSD? So uh, the FreeBSD kernel has some cool features like jails, also ZFS support, something which seems uh, difficult to happen in uh, the Linux kernel, also the OpenBSD packet filter. Depending on your devices, the, the device support can be better or worse. It depends. <laughs> it's also one of the advantages that you can add diversity among all your machines while keeping the same user land so you can administrate them the same way. Uh, and uh, it, ca it is able to run GNU FreeBSD uh, binaries, FreeBSD binaries, and also Linux binaries. So if you really need to run all these binaries, it can be very useful. And also, we choose to make that because it's something we can do, and Debian is a universal OS. 
And but we can ask us the question why just don't use FreeBSD? So the FreeBSD per system is very different from the Debian packaging system. So you may prefer the Debian way to install package. Uh, the same way you can prefer the new user land over the BSD one. And also we are providing a GPL contaminated kernel that is we are enabling uh, XT2FS, RiserFS, XFS. So uh, that you don't have to rebuild your kernel to have this feature. And we are making sure it is 100% free according to the DFSG. And so we don't have the same uh, license policy as uh, FreeBSD. So the statue of uh, the Nuki FreeBSD port, uh, unfortunately we it's not yet an official port because we are lacking a few uh, requirements, mainly uh, the Debian installer. But we have uh, an up-to-date toolchain, including Java, ADA and uh, K3BSD E386. We also have Mono. Uh, we have a lot of packages built on Knu K3BSD, and uh, we the build demons are able to build them uh, with uh, an up-to-date rate of 95%. And we have uh, a lot of packages uh, available that is. Uh, GNOME or KDE for the desktop environment, but also uh, Apache, MySQL, or PostgreSQL, so the server environment. Uh, we will, as we can't release uh, with uh, Lenny, we will make a snapshot of seed at the time of Lenny release. Uh, some packages uh, will be uh, will have a higher version, but we consider that it could be stable enough for for a port. And uh, I want to remind you that there are developer accessible machines. So if you want to try, it's really easy if you are a developer. If not, you can uh, send a mail and we can create an, an account. And to show you that it works, here is a nice snapshot where we can see that we can play, uh, we can edit images, we can just surf on the web or watch video. If you need more information, there is a, a, a page on the Debian Wiki. Any question? That's all. Thank you. The next one is Casaro about marking uh, people in group photos. He, he's doing the work in our group photo. Hello? Uh, do you listen to me? Yes. Well, um, you're just doing the setup. And we are going to show you what we've been working the last days. We've been trying to uh, create a program that can show uh, people's face in a picture. We had a previous script that could do that, but it required it that you fed it with the location of every person's face. And then we had to do that manually, and then we have created a program to do that. We don't do that using artificial intelligence. We do that using human intelligence. So a person got to use it and click on their face. But, well, um, we created a program to show it. Then it, it does not generate a video. It programmatically shows every frame. And we've been working with different frameworks to do that. We have used it SDL, Cairo, and finally we've reached that to the conclusion that GTK from GTK would be fine, and it it could generate a a nice video. It's not finished yet. It uh, last version does not does not show people's names yet. Uh, <laughs> well, so Lincoln is going to show uh, what he has done, which is the interface is using Python GTK to mark people's face. Well, he is able to select a picture, and then we have our group photo there. The video dimensions did not do anything by now. And, well, if you could help the, us with the names. Well, this is Hoga, right? You can mark his face and write his name there. And then you do that with 
every other people's face, and that's why in, we, we need your human intelligence to help us. Um, well, if you can see that when you select the name, that the there's a green, and you can move if you have messed with it. You can change the place, and you can change the names and everything else. Then you save this file. Um, I'm not sure it's going to work, but well. <laughs> well, then you have to, no, no, please move it to, move the file. Don't worry. <laughs> move the file uh, to, where is it? <laughs> yeah. Is it a ceiling? Right. So <coughs> please run it. Oh, this is another file. It have four faces in it. And then we are going to try the... Well, then it is going to zoom out and zoom in from face to face. It will stop for a few seconds on each face, and it should just show people's names right there. Um, so we are going to try to in, uh, provide you with this software so you can help us, and then we can finally produce a final uh, data set which we can use to show the final video. Well. Uh, there is a, a Git repository, so if you can get the software, it's on HTTP uh, git.coscardo.info slash movie.git. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you will stay here and do the next talk? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think it's good. Uh, our uh, next talk is about Quake, another terminal emulator. Uh, this is Quake. Uh, uh, have you ever played uh, FPS games like Quake or Open Arena? So uh, this was the, the, the idea of Quake. Uh, provide an easy uh, keyboard access uh, to, to the terminal. And when you type a, a simple keyboard uh, access key, you, you show the uh, Quake or hide it. Uh, we can create another new tab here. Uh, it's. Uh, I think we can compare it with Terminator uh, with a simple difference that we just don't split the screen. We just create another tab. But uh, the the main uh, cool feature in Greek is the the easy uh, the easy way to access it and to hide it. Uh, it was based on some uh, GNOME standards. We are using uh, Python and uh, a VDE uh, widget. To, to make the, the, the terminal. Some, some options uh, like the window size can be controlled by the property window or you can just click here and, and drag. Uh, the first thing, uh, it's because Quake aims to be uh, GNOME uh, Human Interface Guideline is compliant, and we are thinking about implement new features in Quake, but we don't want to bloat the user interface and the options, so uh, we are hiding some options uh, that make uh, Quake better. Uh, for example, uh, I don't like to, to, when I am using the, the full screen, feature uh this this this, this two bars is it's just just clutter clutter me so i like to hide this two bar <coughs> and
And now when I set the full screen, I can use my Quake. Uh, and Quake, a uh, Quake actually is not uh, a full featured terminal. It's just a terminal to give an easy uh, terminal, <laughs> a easy access to a terminal. Uh, and uh, have uh, two programs uh, like it for KDE. And so we have Tilda and Quake to GNOME, GTK. So I think it's all. <laughs> Oh yeah, we are very glad because during this this conference, Debian go to a APT, so you can just install it in your Debian. Thank you. The next talk is from Jonathan about the queuing maintenance. Hi. Um, can you all hear me? Um, I don't really have very much to say, hence a lightning talk. I probably won't even take two minutes. Um, we've previously had issues with queuing updates sort of taking a while to process. There have been various flame wars about that, various people unhappy about it, and I just thought I'd stand up and say uh, I believe that's not the case anymore. Um, I was added by James in uh, April or May time to Keyring Main. There's still the both of us who have full access to it. Uh, currently, I believe there are about seven outstanding tickets on the Keyring, all of which I've either followed up to or are waiting for responses from the um, requesters. Uh, I unfortunately discovered that we actually have the oldest RT ticket, uh, number five. The only single digit RT ticket is still open. Um, can you show me the next slide? Oh. Um, if you need to update your key and you have a good reason, not just because you feel like you want a, a different ID or whatever, if your key gets compromised, if your um, key expires, then these are the ways you can talk to us. There's a website which has very basic HTML but does tell you what you need to do. Um, you can send a key to keyring.debian.org. If you are only updating sub keys or an expiration date, just send the key to keyring.debian.org. I'm processing those at least once a month. If you need it done faster, raise a ticket and it'll get done faster, but a month seems to work at the moment. Um, if you need to raise a ticket, keyring at rt.debian.org. You need to include Debian RT or you don't get past the spam filters. You need to include something descriptive. That helps me look at it and go, right, that needs done now immediately, or you know, that can wait until I've got a bit more time. Um, you can log in, key requests, go to the um, keyring incoming queue, which very few people have read access to. That means if there's um, some security issue with your key, it's not public knowledge. Once I've looked at them in triage, then they go into the public key ring queue. That's visible with the default Debian read-only RT username and password, which I can't remember, but went to Debian Devel announced some time ago when the RT instance was thing. So you can track, if you think that something isn't happening and should be, you can check the RT, see if someone's followed up. If they haven't, feel free to ping me. If you have a problem with your key, this is what you use. I will read this. I will follow up. If you think there's an outstanding problem that isn't being chased, follow up to the RT ticket, and it will get sorted out. Um, that's basically all I have to say. Uh, the system is now <laughs> working fine. I haven't had any complaints, but then maybe they didn't put Debbie and RT in the subject. So, mm -hmm. thank you. The next one is I show you about brainstorming about online services.
On. <laughs> on is much better than off. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, is there a time that I can see also? Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, I have a lot more to say about all these things that I'm not going to tell you right now. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there's four freedoms that the FSF describes for free software. Freedom to run the program for any purpose, the freedom to study and adapt the program, the freedom to share copies, and the freedom to improve and release that. But if you think about me sitting at a uh, web application, I'm sitting at the Google box and I'm thinking, can I run it on myself? I can't find out how it works because they won't give it to me. I can't share it because they didn't give me a copy to share. And I can't improve the Google search engine that I'm sitting typing things into because I don't have a copy to improve. But it's not even just that I'm not allowed to. It's that structurally, it's far away from me. So even if I, I mean, it's, it's not like proprietary software where, you, you know, you, you're not allowed to, to exercise the four freedoms, but you can. You just might go to jail. It's, it's actually that you can't. So that's a real difference. Um, so this is one perspective on running free software, running non-free software as a service, it seems to me. Um, if you keep, anyway. So, <laughs> so I, I, this, like, this is a bit extreme, obviously. But if you, if, you do, if you choose to have someone else run lots of non-free software that you rely on, then obviously you're still using the non-free software. Um, but you might choose to do that because it provides features you like or because they maintain it so you don't have to actually install it. Um, I did a quick survey of my free software mailing list archive from the past like six months, just my lists folder, and uh, more than a quarter of the email addresses are at gmail.com. So there's a lot of Gmail users. Um, and uh, it, okay, so in addition to all these these features and not system mining it, there are network effects um, for sites. Well, for sites like oh, I have skipped some slides of mine. Anyway, for sites like LinkedIn or Olo or Facebook, you want to use those websites because the people you want to talk to are there. It's not like email where you can use a different client where the messages will get routed. If you don't use that website, if you don't use their software running on their computers, you can't talk to those people. Um, so I was, I've been brainstorming about this idea of mine called rogue interoperability, where uh, you, you're not supposed to interoperate, but you do. Facebook has an internal messaging service you can use to send messages between users, which is strictly worse than email. So you should just make a gateway to IMAP and SMTP. And then you can use MUT or Pine or whatever for Facebook messaging for the people who send you Facebook messages. Um, there's, a, there's a website, Twitter, where you can send small messages to other people. Um, it's, it's a silo, so it's like sending messages on a BBS in that you have to be on that, that domain to send and receive the messages. There's another network called Identica Electronica, which is, has provides the software services of Twitter, but gives you the software and can federate between domains. So, uh, Twitter is like BBS email, and Laconica is like internet email. But there's no gateway between the two. So if you want to use the, dist the distributed federated system, you would need something like what I'm prototyping now called Intertweet that routes messages between the two systems. Um, and you know, it, one of the things you might use free software, you might enjoy in free software, is the ability to add new features. There's a, uh, again, back to Facebook. There's a, uh, when you go to Facebook, and you look at someone's profile, if they list their email address, um, it's shown as an image. So I wrote a tool that OCRs it uh, in line, and a Firefox add-on to do that in line when you view the page. So you go to the user profile, you see the, the image, you wait about six seconds for it to get sent to my server, process to come back, and in line it gets turned into text, which you can copy and paste. Um, and you know, one of the freedoms you might want to exercise is the freedom to use a program for any purpose, uh, F -mail I Gmail is two things. It's a server-side daemon that stores your mail and talks to your web browser, and a JavaScript set of code that runs on your web browser that implements a nice-looking interface. So F -mail is something that I'm halfway through writing again that uh, lets you take the JavaScript and retarget re it so that the, the Gmail interface can be used against your server, not the Gmail server. <laughs> so... Relevance, impact, uh, kind of like running software on the mainframe, 
but bye. <laughs>
force the um, configuration of certain email server to do whatever you want to do. But uh, the best way to do it is really program it. I mean, uh, you only have to program two pieces of code for a mail server. The first one is the mail routing uh, uh, decision, where you just say uh, whatever uh, whether the mail is local, the mail should be sent off, uh, outside, or the mail is uh, unre unreliable. Yes, and um, the other one is when you are really uh, doing the local delivery, where when you, most people uses proc mail or things like that. Uh, you can put uh, better. Um, you, you you can do better uh, decisions when you actually program what whatever you need. So, uh, late 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 TPD uh, has something. It also has a uh, Lua support in its config file. You can actually program a little on the config file. Uh, so I, I took the idea from there. And what? Ah, the time is off. So this code is not published yet. I am trying to use it in my laptop. It works, but it needs some more work. So that's all. Uh, thank you.